you know, it's Fugitive Australian Journalist Shane Dowling from the website kangarooquarteraustralia.com. Now, on Sunday, the 5th of March 2023, I published an article titled AFP Commissioner Rhys Kershaw colluded with Rupert Murdoch and Bruce Lerman's lawyers to undermine rape trial. Now, I'm going to bet that I'm about to read you out the letter. Uh, and the article starts off below with a letter from AC Director of Public Prosecution, Shane Drumgold, sent to ACT Chief Police Officer Neil Gornhan, outlining evidence of corrupt police trying to stop rape charges against Bruce Lerman and police colluding with Lerman's lawyers during their rape trial. Now, AC to ACT Policing is a community policing arm of the Australian Federal Police. Now, I'm about to read you out that uh, letter, and I published a letter on Sunday, so you can go there and you can read it in full yourself, but I didn't give a lot of commentary because I wanted people to read it themselves and uh, draw their own conclusions. Now, in relation to the evidence against uh, AFP Commissioner Rhys Kershaw and Rupert Murdoch's involvement, I didn't get into it much more than the letter. I think the letter is very damning in itself, as well as the links to the uh, Murdoch's uh, News Corp. Um, a couple of his propagandists, Andrew Bolt, and specifically Jeanette Orbertson of the Australian, uh, she's been publishing leaks from the Australian Federal Police, which or the ACT Police, whichever you want to call them, they're both the same, uh, from the rape trial. So they should be investigating her, arresting her, questioning her, because the leaks were definitely designed to undermine the rape trial, undermine the prosecution of Bruce Lerman. And so why are the police doing that? But anyhow, I'm going to get into the letter. So I'll read you out the letter from the AC Director of Public Prosecution, Shane Drumgold, to the ACT Chief Police Officer. And it starts off, Dear Chief Police Officer, I write to raise serious concerns I hold with what I perceive as some quite clear investigative interference in the criminal justice process in the matter of R. V. Lerman, SCC 264 of 2021. I had intended to address this at the conclusion of the trial. However, the trial's recent vacation and the setting of a new trial date commencing 20 February 2023 demands that I address it now to protect the integrity of the pending trial. I'll first outline some historic context in this matter. Investigation stage. My engagement in the matter of R versus Lerman, which is Regina versus Lerman, the Queen versus Lerman, began on the 31st of March 2021. With that was first touted as a briefing in relation to a sensitive matter. I attended at Belconnen Police Station and met with Redacted Redacted and most other members of the SACAT team. My immediate perception of this meeting was that it was not a briefing at all, rather a clear and overt attempt to use loaded characterizations of some very select evidence in an attempt to persuade me to agree with the position police had clearly adopted. Specifically, the allegations should not proceed to charge. In other words, they shouldn't charge Bruce Lerman. During the meeting, I corrected a number of misconceptions about the importance of other or otherwise of a number of pieces of evidence for police to take on board as part of what I understood was a continuing investigation. Now, I've just read page one, and that's page two. So there you have it, the first meeting. Uh, Drumgold, the Director of Public Prosecutions, met with the police, and they're trying to load him up uh, with select evidence to try and uh, make sure he agrees with them that Bruce Lemon shouldn't be charged. Now, the letter on page two goes on to say, then on 12th of April 2021, at the request of Redacted, I met with him in the conference room of the DPP officers. This meeting was again along a similar vein to the meeting of the 31st of March 2021, leaving me with a very clear impression that Redacted was not seeking my views, rather was very clearly attempting to secure my agreement to a position he had clearly adopted that the matter should not proceed to charge. So no... They've had one crack at uh, meeting with Shane Drumgold to try and uh, get him to agree that Bruce Lemon shouldn't be charged on the 31st of March. Then they've had a second meeting on the 12th of April, and they've done the same thing, trying to pressure Shane Drumgold to make sure Bruce Lemon isn't charged. So why are the police doing that? So I'll go on. Uh, the letter goes on and says, on the 1st of June 2021, there was a third meeting at the DPP, this time with both redacted and redacted, in similar vein to the previous two meetings this time with some further cherry-picked elements of potential evidence advanced as constituting weakness in the case. This meeting concluded with me reminding the officers that there was 
provision for them to seek a formal advice under the AFP DPP collaborative agreement. However, I would require the actual brief of evidence rather than selected characterizations and summaries of the evidence. So that's the third meeting they had on the 1st of June. They're only handing over, select, or not even handing over, they're only raising selected evidence to try and justify not charging Bruce Lerman. They haven't hand, handed over all evidence at that point. And uh, the reason they've gone to the Director of Public Prosecutions, it looks like they could have charged Bruce Lerman themselves, from what I can tell, uh, based on this uh, letter. I don't know the laws in every state, but it looks like they could have charged him themselves. They didn't want to. They've gone to the Director of Public Prosecutions, lent on him to agree with them to justify their own position uh, of not charging Lerman. So the letter goes on. So it must be pointed out there's three attempts. They're putting huge pressure on Shane Grumgold Grum not to charge Bruce Lerman. And the letter goes on to say, I have since become aware of redacted diary notes of a meeting between redacted and redacted held on the 17th of June 2021, in which redacted advanced a view to redacted that there was insufficient evidence to proceed. DCPO, I don't know what that means, advised me he had a meeting with DPP, Director of Public Prosecutions, who stated they will conduct prosecution. DCPO stated it was my choice or I wouldn't proceed, but it's not my choice. There's too much political interference. The notes further record, redacted, stating I said that's inappropriate given I think it's there is insufficient evidence. So what exactly what that means, it sounds like they've... Uh, trying to verbal the Director of Public Prosecution saying he said this and he said that. Notwithstanding their clearly expressed views that this matter should not proceed to charge, on the 21st of June 2021, Redacted served a brief evidence on myself attached to a letter purporting to request advice. However, really outlining further mischaracterizations and other inaccurate select summaries of evidence that were clearly advanced as a list of reasons why I should agree with a position clearly already taken by Redacted and shared by Redacted, that the matter should not proceed to charge. This document contained blatant misrepresentations of evidence, such as suggestions that the key evidence was deliberately deleted by the complainant, a proposition not supported by the tested evidence at trial, as well as a list of evidence that is clearly inadmissible in trial. The letter concludes with a further overt attempt to imply pressure to the conclusion of my resulting advice. Now, letter goes on to say, Ms Higgins' credibility is a cornerstone of the prosecution case, and given the above articulated issues and that there is a limited corroborative evidence of sexual intercourse taking place or consent being withdrawn or not provided, investigators have serious concerns in relation to the strength and reliability of evidence, but also, more importantly, her mental health and how any further prosecution may affect her well-being. So they've actually, looks like they've actually written up a conclusion for him to sign off attacking Miss Higgins and, or not attacking her so much, but uh, attacking the credibility or the weakness of the case. Now on page three, it starts off. On the 20, on 28 June 2021, I provided a minute to redacted advising that I was of the view that there were reasonable prospects of conviction and the matter should proceed to charge. It transpired that on the day the summons was sworn, being 6th of August 2021, direct, redacted were directed that a full brief of evidence be served directly on the first defence team rather than through the DPP, which was extremely unfortunate as it was unlawfully included both protected counselling notes and evidence in chief interview videos. So the police should have handed all over all the evidence, brief evidence to the Director of Public Prosecutions, who then hands it over to the lawyers. But they haven't. They've gone directly to the lawyers, uh, Bruce Lehman's lawyers, and handed over evidence and counselling notes, etc., that they should have never handed over in the first place. And clearly they've done that deliberately, given they're putting pressure on the Director of Public Prosecutions to drop the charge or not, not charge him in the first place. Then they've done a dirty, sneaky trick like this, and it, there's no way in the world it was an accident. It had to be deliberate. Now, the letter goes on to say, it further transpired that Mr. Lerman's summons was at first mentioned on the 16th of September 2021, and the matter was committed for trial that eventually commenced on the 4th of October 2022, and the jury being discharged due to misconduct by one juror on the 27th of October 2022. 
Collateral to this, the complainant has long expressed concerns that during the investigation stage she felt bullied by police who she felt were pressuring her into discontinuing the complaint. This is, an, this is an observation corroborated by at least two of her support people. Although this is a matter for her to raise directly with the AFP, which is Australian Federal Police, it is relevant to our purposes as it impacted the trial process as she presented as highly anxious in dealing with either the police or, by extension, the DPP. This resulted in her requesting all engagement be conducted through the Victims of Crime Commissioner to in insulate her from direct contact and further pressure by police, either directly or vicariously through the DPP. Then on the 22nd of September 2021, investigators reported to make the victim of crime commissioner a witness by conducting a recorded interview with her in which they asked her two highly unusual lines of questions. First was how she became involved with the complainant and the second was her recolle recollection of a conversation between the complainant redacted and redacted that she was present at. On the 2nd of October 2021, I received a letter from yourself stating that because she was now a witness, the AFP could no longer communicate through her. This was a highly unusual step as a complainant was also a witness, yet police still had extensive contact with her until she requested all contact be made through the Victim of Crime Commissioner. So that sounds like the police are trying to pull a swifty uh, Brittany Higgins has felt under pressure to drop the complaint by the uh, ACT police, which are the AFP police, Australian Federal Police. And so she decided she didn't want to deal with them anymore. And so she had a victim of a crime commissioner being the communicator between the two. And so they, uh, the police pulled a swifty there trying to make the victim of crime commissioner a witness, saying, oh, we can't deal with her now. She's a witness. Well, Brittany Higgins was a witness to <laughs> So, anyhow, the letter goes on to say uh, concerns relating to the trial process. During the conduct of the trial, a number of disturbing events have occurred, including prosecution witness redacted, firstly giving evidence directly contradictory to her chief of staff, then directly soliciting transcripts of other evidence to tailor her evidence direct from the defence barrister, Steve Wybo. She further engaged in direct coaching of the defence cross-examination of the complaint, uh, complainant by directing them to evidence she should not have access to. This was all done through direct contact with Defence Barrister Steve Wybro. Redacted further organised for her partner to attend the court for the entire trial, with him regularly seen conferencing with the defence team during the course of the entire trial. So, redacted further organised for her partner to attend the court. That, well, we all know who that is, but I won't name him. Name her. Um, and it sounds like her partner was conferencing with the defence team <laughs> during the course of the trial. Unbelievable. Well, it doesn't seem like it. Pretty well says that exactly. With him really seen conferencing with the defence team uh, during the course of the entire trial. That's Linda Reynolds, uh, Senator Linda Reynolds. I will name her. Her husband was conferencing with the defence team. Unbelievable. I didn't know that till then. Now, it goes on to say on page three, the conduct of investigators has been equally as concerning. Redacted and a number of other current and former SACAT members have been attending key parts of the later stages of the trial, and I've noted they have also been regularly conferencing with the defence team during the breaks. The defence team have further been directing further investigations directly through investigators, in one case relating to the evidence of a member of SCAT, redacted after her evidence was concluded. We have discovered this when we received an unsolicited email from a redacted on the 13th of October 2022 outlining some additional points to her evidence. This was followed by an email from a redacted dated 14th of October 2022 at 2.54pm 2 stating, I've also attached the email EM sent yesterday regarding Philip Medical Centre inquiries. The bosses just want to confirm it has been seen and passed on to defence. Then 16 minutes later, at 3.10pm, the redacted attempted to recall the, this email, replace it with another one stating, I've attached the email sent yesterday regarding Philip Medical Centre. I'm just checking that it was received and passed on to defence. It appears that he wanted to replace the bosses just want to confirm with I'm just checking. Well, that raises two issues. Number one, we know 
the police colluding with Bruce Maloman's lawyers goes to the top or goes very high up because it says the bosses want to confirm. So there's several bosses because it's a plural. We've got a plural there. I'm making a crack at that because it's from an old case, so I won't head down that path. But So we've got uh, a number of bosses. How many? It doesn't say. Want to confirm it's been seen and passed on. So they're involved in the investigation. They're involved in the communication with Bruce Lerman's lawyers, either directly or indirectly. So they're keeping a very close eye on it. And that's where my argument, and I'll make that argument at the end, that uh, Rich Kershaw is involved. He signed off on it. But you also got the police meeting with the defence team during the breaks. The courthouses are massive. You'll have the courtroom, then you'll have meeting rooms outside the courtroom. Uh, I've been in the you know, the federal court uh, building and the Supreme Court building in uh, Sydney many, many times are the same building. And you'll go up to whatever level it is, um, and they'll have, say, four, five, six courtrooms, and they'll have numerous meeting rooms outside. So if you're in court for a hearing and people are meeting outside, you know it's going down. It's blatantly obvious, and that's why uh, the Director of Public Prosecution, Shane Drumgold, is saying it became obvious they're meeting. We could see them meeting, obviously. <laughs> Because they're going outside the court, straight into the meeting rooms. Um, because you'll have a hallway right down the middle of all the different courtrooms and the meeting rooms, so you can see. And, and, which the point I'm trying to make is, it's so blatantly they just did not care. And the reason they did not care, I can tell you, is there was no way in the world would they ever suspect J Shane Drumgold would make a formal complaint because they know the public service is set up to intimidate whistleblowers, so no one blows a whistle, and that's why they're prosecuting you know, numerous whistleblowers now, the federal government. Now, the letter goes on to say, finally, on the discharge of the jury on the 27th of October 2022, Defence Barrister Stephen Wybro spoke to my junior, redacted, and stated that he had a meeting with the investigators, and they had suggested that he contact me and firstly suggest that I'm not impartial, and consequently request that I should outsource the decision as to whether or not to rerun the trial to someone outside of the office. Further, during the discussion that with defence regarding the potential application for bail condition that the accused surrendered his passport, Mr. Wybro stated on the transcript, we have spoken with the Australian Federal Police. They have no concerns at all about Mr. Lerman being a flight risk. This is an embellishment of the constant exclusive direct engagement police have had with the defence rather than with the prosecution in the lead-up and during the trial. Now, by rights, once it's at trial, the police should not be dealing with the defence team. They should be dealing with the director of public prosecutions. They're meant to work together uh, to some degree to uh, get the prosecution. But the federal police have been dealing directly with Lerman's lawyers. They've even asked Lerman's lawyers to approach Shane Drumgold and ask him to stand down from the matter because they're saying he's not impartial. Unbelievable. Running the show. Lerman's lawyers weren't running the defence. For Bruce Lerman, Australian federal police were running the defence. Unbelievable by this letter. And I have no doubt it's the truth because the Australian federal police haven't denied one word in it at this point. And here the letter goes on to say, later that day I phoned Mr. Wybro and sought clarification on his comment relating to the request to outsource the decision of whether we to rerun the trial. Firstly, he acknowledged the comment was made, but then stated that his ongoing discussions with investigators were none of the prosecutor's business, uh, prosecution's business. Unbelievably, he got snappy then because he probably told the federal police and they said, mate, don't talk to him. Don't, you should have said nothing. You, you've dropped us in. <laughs> So later the day, after he's obviously spoke to the federal police, he shut up shop. No, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Letter goes on to say, from first engagement, it has been clear from redacted down, key AFP members have had a strong desire for this matter not to proceed to charge. Then when charge is a result of the investigator's interests are clearly aligned with the successful defence of this matter rather than its prosecution. The motive for both, which remains concerning, as a colliery, however, there have now been uh, there have now been over one and a half years of consistent and inappropriate interference by investigators, firstly directed towards my independence, with a very clear campaign to pressure me to agree with investigators not to charge. Then, during the 
conduct of the trial itself, far less tempting to influence any decision on a retrial. Now, it goes on to say, I am of the view that at the conclusion of the trial, there should be a public inquiry to both political and police conduct in this matter. However, it appears clear that this is a continuing to be a significant factor during the ongoing conduct of the trial. I accordingly request that a direction be issued to all police to remove themselves from any engagement in this matter beyond being called as a witness for the prosecution. This includes no further contact with defence or the other prosecution witnesses, no contact with an complainant and prohibiting attendance at court beyond formal evidence if required. I further seek your support for an inquiry to be conducted at the conclusion of the trial process into the conduct of police investigators in the lead up to charge and beyond during the trial process itself. Yours faithfully, Shane Drumgold, SC, Director of ACT Public Prosecutions. Now, that's a letter for you. It's very powerful, obviously. There's two points I want to make. Firstly, uh, the trial, the second trial ended up being aborted. Uh, it was decided that it would be too much pressure for Brittany Higgins. She was suffering mental health issues, so they decided not to proceed. Then number two, an inquiry has been set up by the ACT government, and they're due to report, I think, in June, July. That date isn't too important, I don't think, because quite often these inquiries are extended. So it might be extended a few months, and we don't know when they're going to release the findings anyhow. But my viewpoint is it's going to have to end up being a federal inquiry uh, because ACT inquiry, I don't think they're going to have the power to call the federal politicians. There's a number of them who are allegedly and knowingly involved in the cover-up. Uh, so whether the ACT inquiry's got the power to call them, I doubt it. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, maybe the ACT inquiry does have the power given the, gov the federal government is in the ACT. Who knows? But uh, I'll keep on following up with that. But probably two of the most powerful things are the AFP, they haven't denied any allegations in that letter. I couldn't remember them uh, doing so. And I also went through the AFP website, the media website yesterday, and there's no nothing there. It doesn't mention it. They haven't put out a statement denying the allegations. They haven't put out a statement saying they're suspended police pending an investigation. They've said bugger all. And also uh, Rupert Murdoch and his involvement He's come out uh, with a Dominion uh, defamation trial in the US that uh, Rupert Murdoch and Lachlan Murdoch are very hands-on. I've published a couple of videos recently where Lachlan Murdoch has said on video um, that he's in regular contact with the editors, making sure they've got the message right. He's propaganda, that is. So they'd both be well aware of the leaks coming from the AFP, which are going to uh, the, uh, the Australian, Jeanette Orbison, who's been writing articles based on leaks from the AFP. So they they know full well the leaks are coming and they're pushing their propaganda in a big way and they've got their attack dog, uh, Andrew Blott, attacking Brittany Higgins. So the cover-up is in full swing. I'm going to leave it at that at this point because the inquiry is afoot. I'm going to be making submissions to the inquiry and I'll obviously be publishing plenty more in the near future. Now, make sure you visit my website, Kangaroo Court of Australia. You'll be able to read that uh, letter in full. Probably best to read it in full first and listen to this uh, video because then you, you'll have a lot of the background and you'll fully understand what I'm talking about. But it, go, go and read it again and then come back and listen to the uh, video again because uh, one hell of a powerful letter relating to evidence. You rarely get insiders blowing the whistle on government corruption. And with Shane Drumgold, who's a Director of Public Prosecution, blowing the whistle on police corruption, the cover-up of an alleged rape, doesn't get much more powerful than that. And he's got documented evidence of it and obviously witnesses. Now, Kangaroo Court of Australia, my website, YouTube channel, Facebook page, we're independent media uh, and we're reliant on donations to keep publishing. So please support my Patreon account. It's currently sitting at 221 supporters with $1,564 pledged per month. The ultimate target is to try and get it up to 1,000 supporters. And uh, you can donate any amount, $3, 5 10 15 20 30 40 whatever suits your budget. It all helps out and helps us uh, keep publishing. And please share this video on uh, Facebook and Twitter, etc. Other than that, thank you for your time and have a good day.